Welcome councillors, members of the public and staff. I declare this meeting open at 6.36pm. Um, before we start, I'd just like to um, acknowledge that it's International Women's Day today and wish everyone a, a happy International Women's Day. As you can see, we've got a, we're celebrating by having the majority of councillors here tonight females. So well done and happy Women's Day, all of you. Um, everyone at this meeting is reminded to conduct themselves in a polite and professional manner, keep communication factual, use appropriate language and tone, do not use any defamatory or derogatory remarks, defamation laws apply to addresses in public forum. I also ask councillors to observe the requirements under the Code of Meeting Practice and Meeting Etiquette. I remind all present that video recording is an official record of council and may be made available made available to persons upon request in accordance with the government Seconded by Councillor Musker. All those in favour? Um, declare that carried. Do any councillors wish to make any disclosures of interest? Councillor Werner. Thank you. Um, I would like to make a disclosure of a non significant, non pecuniary interest. I believe we've got the um, the draft development control plan and there might be some changes to the um, uh, subdivisions and just wanted to say that um, uh, my principal place of residence is in that area but it doesn't affect it because it, it's not within the range of um, sizes that would affect that. Thanks. Thank you Councillor Werner. Councillor Curry. Um, yeah, as per previous items, just that I own a property that may or may not be impacted by the subdivision. Um, can I just ask, Mr. C, <coughs> do I remove myself because it's a secondary? Chair. Yes, Councillor Zarovanovsky. Oh, um, I was just going to declare. Um, oh, oh. Are you there? Yeah, we can hear you, Councillor. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I was just going to declare. I mean, I'm not sure if I declare or not. My property, my place of residence, um, does not meet the criteria for any subdivision or dual occupancy. Through the chair, uh, councillor, you can declare a less than significant just to put it on the minutes, right. um, and you can still participate uh, in the discussion and voting, provided there's no material impact on your property or those of uh, your family and, and so on. Yeah, well, then I'll declare less significant um, non pecuniary interest as uh, my place of uh, residence. Is not affected in any way due to the changes that's been suggested. Yep. Uh, can I just ask Mr. Soot 
Would we all have to um, make this de same declaration if we own property? Um, I, I would probably advise, um, for the record, to put it on as a less than significant, uh, um, other than, obviously, if um, you have property which will be materially impacted or your relatives and so on have a property that will materially be impacted, then it should be a pecuniary interest. Thank you. Um, so we'll just go around the room, Councillor Musket. Thank you. Councillor Barlow. Thank you, Councillor Douglas. I'll declare it non significant, but I think it's a pecuniary interest, and they do own property here, but I would say that it's a certificate of interest. Thank you, and I'll do the same. So, less than significant non pecuniary interest for my principal place of residence. Thank you. Um, so, on to the minutes of the previous meeting. Can I ask two councillors who are present at the meeting to move and second the confirmation of minutes? Councillor Musket moved. Seconded Councillor Barlow. All those in favour? Carried. Um, so there are five items on the agenda for tonight's meeting. So we will um, firstly move to public <coughs> forum. So members of the public who have applied to speak at the meeting are now invited to address the meeting. We have one speaker tonight dealing with item CPE 23.008, post-exhibition report, re-exhibition of draft Bayside Development Control Plan 2022, agenda page 124. So speakers are advised that a warning bell will sound when only one minute of speaking time remains. Speakers who are joining the meeting via the Teams app are to have their video off and micro... I don't need to read that because you're here. Um, speakers are reminded to keep communication factual, polite and professional and to use appropriate language and tone. Do not use any defamatory or derogatory remarks. Defamation laws apply to addresses in public forum. So tonight we have Mr Geoffrey Tullock on behalf of Bexley Chamber of Commerce um, speaking for the committee recommendation. exhibition and re-exhibition of the draft DCP in relation to the specific places provisions for the Bexley Town Centre commencing at clause 7.1. In both cases there was no change recommended to the DCP because of my submissions. In summary, clause 7.1 of draft DCP is proposing redevelopment of the Alban Street car park with a new public space with pedestrian connection to Forest Road. This proposal originates from the much larger Bexley Town Centre DCP 68, prepared for Rockdale City Council in September 2003. It was later modified and used in DCP 2011. This almost 20 year design doesn't take account of the current traffic conditions in Bexley, nor the way that we live and work in the wake of COVID-19, nor that Bexley is now firmly in the process of urban renewal nor does it recognise recent refurbishment of the public domain. It's also very narrow in its treatment of Bexley, uh, neglecting other areas of the centre which were well covered in DCP 68. My submissions pointed out several technical errors and conditions unattractive to developers, such as uh, dedication of private land to council at no cost to facilitate the construction of Alban Lane. I think there's about six properties involved in that. I also suggested that the definition of the town centre be extended along Forest Road and Stony Creek Roads to include the full extent of our commercial precinct. And that goes from pretty well the RSL Club on Stony Creek Road to uh, Westminster Street, I think, on Forest Road. 
Neither of these issues were responded to in the post-exhibition report. I suggested that a comprehensive master plan be prepared for Bexley uh, as a high priority and included in DCP 2022. Alternatively, Clause 7.1 could be brought up to date. The post-exhibition report responded that a Bexley <coughs> master plan would align with investigation of the Cogra to Parramatta Rail Link which has the possibility of a station at Bexley uh, subject to council lobbying. Um, the investigation for this is 10 to 20 years. Uh, uh, my point is to wait for this long to get some decent planning in Bexley is probably missing the boat. I think in 10 to 20 years, most of the centre will be uh, well and truly developed if we're going um, down the path we're going now. Um, thank you for the time taken uh, to, to, to listen to me today. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tullock. Um, we will now deal with this item, but before we have a mover and a seconder, I'll just call on our director to give a brief summary of this report. Um, thanks, Chair. Perhaps if I can just um, make two um, remarks um, following the speaker's comments. Um, the DCP was primarily a consolidation exercise to bring together the two um, former council DCPs. Um, there wasn't any um, significant review of policy in there or the direction for particular locations or town centres. It was largely just an exercise to bring them all together and to harmonise them. Um, the changes that were made really centre around choosing a control to apply to Bayside um, and that might have been one, the control out of one or the other DCPs or one that sat somewhere in between. So apart from those changes, there really wasn't any review of policy uh, per se in there. Um, so that, that's the reason why these provisions are being carried over from the Rockdale DCP um, and they, they weren't reviewed um, and that's the case for, for other centres that are in the DCP as well. Um, second remark I guess is that um, Bexley itself is not identified as a priority in Council's um, local strategic planning statement or housing strategy um, for review. Um, there's a number of other centres in there and Council's recently signed off on investigating three, um, three other centres. Um, so in terms of our work program or the roadmap that Council has, Bexley's not identified there as a high priority, so we wouldn't be planning to review this, um, what's in the, in the draft DCP um, in, the, in the near future. Um, it would be something that's probably more on a 10-year time horizon, so we would need a direction otherwise uh, if, if we were to do that. Um, just on the report generally, so councillors might remember that the draft DCP um, came to you late last year. <coughs> um, council wanted to um, refine controls in relation to car parking rates and carports in front setbacks. Um, so those two parts of the DCP have been amended and went back out to public exhibition. Um, so this report brings back to you the submissions that we received and they're all detailed in the report and the, the attachment. There's a table there that outlines the submissions and, and the response to them. Um, so it's now back to you um, to make a, a final decision on, on um, which direction you'd like to go um, on parking and carports in particular. Um, and if that can be resolved by council, then the DCP can be adopted and it would replace the two former council DCPs. Thank you. Um, Madam, Madam Chair, can I just ask a question, if I may? Yes, Councillor Saravanovsky. Uh, I'm, um, I'm just reading through the report again. Are we looking at um, DCP in the Rockdale Town Centre? Uh, through you, Chair, um, this DCP applies to all of um, Bayside LGA. So there are provisions in there for um, various town centres as well as general provisions for the cover the whole area. Right. Through you, Madam Chair, to Fausto, um, how do I deal with it on my previous declarations in terms of Rockdale Town Centre? <coughs> uh, through the Chair. So if um, your interests are impacted, as I've mentioned, by... Uh, the uh, consolidation of the DCPs and the changes um, impact on uh, your property interests or those of your uh, relatives or associates, then um, you'll need to make the call as to uh, whether you um, declare a pecuniary interest and walk out or... Um, in some cases, it might be a less than, sorry, it might be a significant uh, non-pecuniary interest, which 
you will need to also um, absent yourself. So in the past, uh, you have absent yourself. Yep. So um, I, I, I think that would be yeah, appropriate. Yeah, so Madam Chair, so this one that we're dealing with now is the Rockdale Town Centre. Uh, yeah. Yes, um, Mr Barber, can you...? Yes, Chair, it does. Yep. Yes. All right, so therefore I'll declare a, a, um, a peculiar interest in terms of the town, Rockdale Town Centre, which I've previously declared. So I'll abstain from uh, uh, in this debate on this item. Um, thank you. Um, and I'll switch off. Yes. Yep, thank you. We'll just wait a moment to make sure. So I think we're right now. So, um, councillors, do I have a um, mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Musket, seconded by Councillor Douglas. Are there any um, questions on this report? Go ahead, Councillor. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, through you, Chair. So the question was, were the Transport for New South Wales recommendations incorporated? Um, no. The, um, the recommendation in the report leaves it open to Council to choose which rates it wants to go with. <coughs> um, the rates that are in the version that's attached to the report um, are the rates that Council asked to go on exhibition. So um, if, that, if what's in attachment one's adopted, they're the rates that Council preferred, not the Transport for New South Wales rates. So, so to clarify, we're, as part of the recommendation, we're deciding on the rates tonight in the recommendation. So they're currently not in there. Um, so <coughs> we're clarifying whether it's the, the rates that went on um, exhibition or the rates that have been suggested as change, the previous rates. Are there any... Um, Councillor Musket? So I believe if we want to um, want to adopt what was published in the um, exhibited plans, we would be deleting item two and deleting point two of item three, which uh, yeah point two of item three, which specifies the final parking rates and provisions in relation to carports as determined by council. So. Um, is that okay for you to to accept that change, Councillor Musket? Yes. Are there any? Um Um, through your chair, I'd recommend that council, if you wanted to revisit anything in Bexley, that you do that as a separate amendment to the DCP. Um, I think it's preferable that this one goes through as a whole of Bayside DCP 
And if there's particular issues you want to revisit, we can look at that at, at any time. Council can amend the DCP at any time. Thank you. Um, through you, Chair, <coughs> the local strategic planning statement is really a council's kind of roadmap for um, areas that it wants to investigate or, or make some change in. Um, that document's only a couple of years old and um, not due to be reviewed for a few more years, so that, that would be the best place to do it, but you could look at the DCP separately if you think there's good reason to. Thank you. So are there any um, further questions? Councillor Douglas? Um, through you, Chair, there's, yeah, there's a range of submissions from various stakeholders and, and from transport as well, as has been mentioned. <coughs> um, and, yeah, transport's view is that, that um, the parking rate should be low, but that's their consistent view across all of Sydney. Um, but um, the DCP is Council's planning policy, and it's, up, it's open to Council to adopt um, whatever rates it sees fit. Um, so, yeah, as has been suggested, if you, if you delete those, those two parts of the resolution, you'll adopt the higher rates that went on exhibition the second time. Um, yeah, through you, Chair. Council did ask that we um, particularly contact um, 20 stakeholders in the development industry. Um, so that included developers, um, builders, um, architects and, and the like. <coughs> um, some of those responded and some didn't. Um, but amongst that group, there were some, for example, that said that there was an impact on the cost of, of housing pro by providing more parking. So, yeah, there was a range of comments in there. Um, and they're all summarised in the, in the table at the end of the report. Thank you. And um, just to clarify, the parking rates don't apply to the proximity around the railway station, so that's, <coughs> that's not affected. So um, if you recall, this was the dis previous discussion that Councillor Morrissey brought up and um, his recommendations were adopted and um, were exhibited. So think, yeah, that's um, the, yep. the background of... That, that's correct, Chair. The, the State Government's um, policy overrides councils within proximity of railway stations, um, so the DCP rates would not apply in those locations. Yep, so are there any um, further questions? Through you, Chair. Uh, some parts of Bayside, there are um, groundwater issues potentially or contamination issues because um, Bayside's quite low lying and the water table is not far down in some situations, so that can add cost to digging a bigger hole in the ground. Um, but essentially that's the issue with basements, it just costs more money to dig a bigger hole, essentially. And through the Chair, there was also information here about um, having the bigger building footprint also will lead to little space for planting deep so which will impact our tree canopy moving forward also. Is that correct? Um, through you, Chair, um, if, if the basement doesn't go further into the ground, deeper, um, then there is a, a possibility that they extend beyond the footprint of the building. Um, so generally we try and contain the basements to the footprint of the building itself so the space around it is available for landscaping and deep soil planting. Um, a higher parking rate can put pressure on um, developers to want to push the, the basement out beyond the footprint of the building so that there's not so much space left, left for landscaping. So that's something that we'd have to manage. That was in the um, some of the attached. Yep, they're in they're in the report.
number of cars that are now in each family and the need to accommodate that parking with what we've got available street-wise as well. So that was a big thing um, because a lot of houses, mine for example, can have three or four cars depending on who's staying in one house at the current time. So a lot of families have not just one car anymore, but they have multiples. So, sorry, Jason, so there's a, a, so the proposed amendments are taken from the <coughs> We adopted the um, amendments, which are on page. Uh, no, let's have a. Are they one twenty nine? So we had a robust debate um, to to increase the parking ratio before this went on public exhibition for um, various reasons, including what Councillor Musket has specified. We're finding that. Um, more and more residents are becoming frequent, uh, increasingly frustrated about um, lack of off-street parking. Um, so we resolved to put the new parking rates on public exhibition um, and this has now come back to us with the summary of submissions that were on public exhibition. Yes, some have said that they don't agree with it but there, have been, there has been some support for it too. Well, it's up to us to decide tonight. So what the recommendation is, is um, we have two choices, to go back to what was originally exhibited or what was re-exhibited the second time. So the first time, for example, um, there was, as you will see on page 126, there was new spaces proposed for a secondary dwelling. Um, we resolved to put one space per dwelling on public exhibition again. And um, so now we're deciding tonight whether we go with the original or the re-advertised public exhibition of the increased um, spaces. So where we're at now is that a um, amendment, well, the, our current decision is that we go with what was on the um, re-advertised um, DCP. So it is a bit confusing. We're the ones that are deciding on the floor tonight which rates we'll go to, go with. Um, the proposal that's come from Councillor Musket is that we go with what was recently exhibited. okay um, but we've had a mover and a seconder for this current exhibition uh, this current proposal so I'll put that to the vote now so um, unless there's any further questions um, through your chair <coughs> pardon me um, in areas that are um, within 800 meters of a railway station, um, the state government's requirements override these. Um, outside of that, um, these are the, the controls that we would use to assess DAs. Um, DCP controls are intended to have some flexibility, so if, if there was a really good argument put, um, then they, they could be varied at council's discretion, but um, yeah, that, this is council's policy, so it is enforceable. So can I just clarify, if, we, if this isn't, uh, if what went on exhibition isn't supported tonight, that also in, uh, refers to the carport um, component of it also. So if um, the motion, if the recommendation for um, version one is not supported, then carports are not part of it. We go back to the, the previous one, which didn't incorporate the carports. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Those are the two things that have changed. <coughs> So are there any um, further questions? Councillor Werner? Um, is that the only change that was made, is that the parking rates? Or were there any other 
um, yeah, through your chair, only the um, the parking rates and um, the provisions that allow carports in the front setback for dwelling houses. Um, the only other changes that are recommended there, you can see a reference to attachment seven. Um, there were some wording changes that were requested by the ports. Um, they're not really of any consequence. They took the opportunity to tell us that um, we should correct some words there. So that's the only other change that's recommended in attachment seven. Councillor Werner. Okay, um, so we have the recommendation in front of us that has been moved and seconded. Do I need to read the...? No, but uh, through you, um, Madam Chair, I just need clarification as to who seconded the... Uh, it was Councillor Douglas. Okay, so we have this um, recommendation in front of the, us. All those in favour? Aye. So carried. Um, I don't believe on this item. Yep. Yep. So not on this item. Yep. So we'll move, if we can get, um, so this this item is carried. So if we can get um, Councillor Zaravanovsky and Councillor Curry back. We're just confirming Councillor Sarah Vignoski. We're still waiting to confirm if Councillor Sarah Vinovsky is online. Might just proceed um, to.
to the next item while we wait for Councillor Saravanovsky. So the next item is CPE 23.004, Post Exhibition Report, Draft Bayside Council Planning Agreement Policy. Um, so before we have a mover and a seconder, we'll just get a brief uh, summary of the report. Um, thanks, Chair. <clears throat> um, this report brings this um, draft policy back to you following um, exhibition, public exhibition. Um, so the report came to you to put in place a policy to guide how we interact with people who may want to offer a planning agreement to council. Um, so these are agreements that are put forward by proponents for DAs or for planning proposals um, where they're offering some community benefit as part of the, the process. Um, the policy just sets out at a high level the principles that we will engage with people on. Um, so it's clear in terms of um, how council will approach these kind of negotiations. Um, and so uh, there were no submissions made during the exhibition period, so it's back um, to council now um, for you to consider finally adopting the policy. Thank you. So do I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Douglas, seconded Councillor Barlow. Is there any questions? Oh, Councillor Werner. <laughs> I'm through you, Chair. <clears throat> um, that's correct. We don't have a, a contribution scheme at this point in time for affordable housing. Um, the, this policy is really um, at a higher level and it outlines the principles that the Council will use in terms of negotiation. Um, I'm not, I'd have to check to see whether affordable housing is referenced in there or not as something that Council would consider accepting. Um, we have in the past through planning agreements for um, the Pagewood Green development. Um, and also development in East Lakes as well, they made a monetary contribution or will make a monetary contribution towards affordable housing. Um, so it's certainly something that that Council has done in the past and there's no reason why we wouldn't in the future. Um, but I'm not sure whether it's mentioned in the policy specifically. Okay. <coughs> Thank you for that. And I have to admit I haven't had time to look at the policy in any great detail yet either. But um, it does mention that we will have it in the policy. Uh, it mentions it in the housing strategy. So um, would we be able to amend the um, recommendation to say that we can look at that? Or if I can assist, <coughs> you know, have a look at that prior to the council meeting and you can pull that out at the council meeting and then make it okay. put forward any um, proposed amendments. So any other questions, councillors? So we have the committee recommendation in front of us, um, moved by Councillor Douglas, seconded by Councillor Barlow. All those in favour? All those against? I declare the recommendation carried. So moving on to item CPE 23.005, information report, finalisation of Bayside LEP 2021 translation, employment zones reform. So. Mr. Barber, are you able to offer a sure, summary? Yeah. Um, this is a report um, just for information of councillors. This um, process has been going on for um, a year or so, run by the Department of Planning. Um, the aim of it was to consolidate the number of zones that are available in, in local environmental plans that relate to um, business and industrial uses. Um, so <clears throat> those zones used to, to be um, under those titles, business and industrial. There's now a new suite of zones um, that are in just employment zones. Um, so they start with an E and not a B or an I. Um, and there's a smaller number of them overall. So it was an exercise in simplifying um, the system, I guess. Um, so it's been led by the Department of Planning. They did seek Council's input um, because there needs to be an exercise gone through to translate our current suite of, of B and e, I zones into E zones. And so they asked the Council for input because with a smaller number of zones, there was some less um, sort of fine grain in terms of um, how they could be applied to different parcels of land. 
<coughs> Council provided that input earlier last year. Um, the department ran an exhibition um, in the middle of last year. They have incorporated um, pretty much all of the comments that Council made in terms of how we wanted the new zones protected in our land. Overall, um, the impact on Bayside is, um, is fairly minimal. Um, there is some areas where certain things are allowed now that weren't before and, and vice versa, um, but there's no really significant changes proposed and, and the process has been concluded. Thank you. Um, I, I note that there seems to be a typo in the recommendation. Should, should that... Um, do we need to... Is it receives and adopts or receives and notes? No. Just receive and note. It's, um, receives and notes. being corrected on the screen. Okay. Yeah, that was an error. Yeah. So... Um, Moved by Councillor Curry, seconded by second uh, by Councillor Barlow. Um, yeah. So, are there any um, questions on this information report? So, we have the recommendation before us that Council receives and notes this report. All those in favour, uh, say aye. aye. All those against, I declare this recommendation <coughs> carried. So we move on to CPE 23.006, Draft Planning Proposal, Heritage Conservation Areas. Um, Mr Barber. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, so, yeah, this report is a, a planning proposal, so it is um, to amend um, Council's Bayside LEP 2021. Um, the purpose of it is to introduce four heritage conservation areas in Bayside. Um, you can see in the summary of the report the four of them are listed there. Um, this is a process that's been going on for a number of years now and it's been reviewed um, on a couple of occasions um, and most recently independently reviewed by another heritage expert um, and their advice was that council should proceed to um, establish these four heritage conservation areas. Um, so that, that's essentially what's before you tonight um, is to um, adopt these um, and then they would be then, the draft planning proposal would be forwarded to the Department of Planning um, to seek their approval to go to public exhibition. So it hasn't been on exhibition as yet. Um, if Council supports it in principle, we'll ask um, the Department of Planning to give their OK for exhibition and then we can receive public feedback and come back to you. OK, thank you. Do I have a um, mover and a seconder for the report? Moved by Councillor Douglas, seconded by Councillor Werner. Are there any questions? Um, through you, Chair, these areas are generally nominated through a heritage study that, that, that a, a council would um, undertake. Um, as I understand it, there's been a number of them done over the years in, in both former council areas and some have resulted in some listings and, and other recommendations haven't gone through. Um, I'd have to check if that particular street has ever been looked at. Um, I suspect it would have been covered by a former Rockdale heritage study at some point in time. Um, these areas have been singled out, I guess, as being the ones that are the most obvious or highest priority to be listed. Um, but there could be others. Um, I'm not sure whether any of my other colleagues here know that particular one. Not off the top of my head. No. no. Um, I can find out some information and um, let you know before the council meeting, if you like. Is it Um, through you, Chair, yeah, it's open to Council at any time to, to consider amending their LEP. Um, 
Um, I'd agree with you. I think it's probably better to let these ones travel through, given that they've been quite a while in the making. Um, we don't have it in our work program to do another heritage study or review at this point in time, but Council could initiate that. Um, uh, as you said, things change over time and we appreciate um, heritage differently. Um, but yeah, that's not currently something that we've got in our work program to do. Can I, um, thank you Mr Barber, can I ask how is a heritage study triggered? Is it generally when a LEP is reviewed or? Um, yes Chair, that's often the time when they're done, when there's a comprehensive review of an LEP um, being done and you might review a whole range of different things, traffic modelling, you know, land uses, economic activity, a whole, you know, housing take up, that sort of thing. So that, that's often when a comprehensive review is done, when the, when the whole plan is being reviewed. Um, our current plan is 2021 and it's a harmonised LEP, so um, that wouldn't happen in that sort of cycle for, for a few years yet, probably four or five years. And um, single heritage items can be nominated at any point in... Yes, that's, that's true, um, Chair. There's, a, there's a, an a appendix at the back of the... Um, or a schedule at the back of the LEP that lists individual properties that are heritage items. So. There's two types of listings. Heritage items apply to individual properties and that's a sort of a higher level of protection. Um, heritage conservation areas are where there's a precinct that has some value. <clears throat> and it may not be that every building in there is a contributory building. There may be some that are out of character with, with the conservation area. Um, so the area is listed more generally. Um, and the aim is to, over time, make sure that development doesn't take place that detracts from what's there. Um, but it doesn't mean that everything that's there is worth preserving. Uh, whereas a heritage item is an individual building or property or item. Thank you. Um, are there any questions, councillors? Councillor Barlow? I was just surprised when I saw this here. I actually thought it was all done and dusted. Because there's someone that lives in, on the streets, that was the one that I was thinking of. Um, I Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Are there any other questions? So we have the committee recommendation before us, um, moved by Councillor Douglas, seconded by Councillor Werner. Um, all those in favour? Aye. All those against? I declare the recommendation carried. Now we move on to the final item tonight, CPE 23.007, Bayside Local Housing Strategy Implementation and Delivery Plan. Um, Mr Barber. Um, thanks, Jed. Um, as the name suggests, this is the, the sort of detailed implementation and delivery plan that sits under the Local Housing Strategy. Um, so going from the top, we have a metropolitan plan we have a district plan that applies to the Eastern District, which Bayside is within. Then we have our local strategic planning statement, and then beneath that is the local housing strategy. Um, so those documents set out our roadmap, if you like, for where we think housing should be accommodated. Um, this document sits underneath all of those. Um, it's a requirement of the Department of Planning for us to map out um, in some finer detail how we're going to deliver on the commitments that we've made in our housing strategy. Um, so you'll see in the, in the table attached um, you know, the, the actions are fairly specific. Um, it's largely a sort of administrative tool, if you like. It's not making any decisions in terms of policy that's been done in the documents that sit above it. Um, this one's really just going into the detail of what we're going to do when um, to deliver on the things we've committed to. Um, the Chair did point out to me earlier that there is an error in um, the, the cell in the table that deals with our housing targets. I'll just find the number. Um, Page 119. Um, there is reference there to um, the last target that's quoted there is 8,151. Um, that target is for the 2026 to 2036 um, period that goes from the um, Bayside to the Bayside Bayside to the Bayside to the Bayside. Thank you. And just to um, clarify, the department sets out this template, so this is um, the required template. That's correct, but yeah. All councils have to use the same template, and as I said, it's really just to... Um, nail down the detail of how we're going to deliver on what we've already promised in the in the housing strategy. Thank you. So the there is 
a recommendation before us um, to endorse this um, housing strategy implementation and delivery plan. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Douglas, seconded by Councillor Musket. Um, any questions, councillors? <laughs> Councillor Douglas. <laughs> Uh, through you, Chair, that, that is correct. Um, so that was the um, Bayside West um, exercise that was um, coordinated by the State Government. Um, so I guess the, the parameters for additional housing in that area have already been established. Um, so there's not, like, this, this plan is really outlining what we're planning to do into the future to facilitate housing. Um, that area has already been looked at through that state-led exercise um, and as a result of that zoning was changed and heights and floor space limits were changed as well. So um, in that sense there's really nothing more to be done in that area for the time being so that, that's why it's not in here. Thank you. Um, Councillor Werner, did you have a question? <laughs> Um, through your chair, um, not at the moment. It's actually being updated by SGS. Uh, it was prepared um, a few years ago and we're actually, they're close to the end of an updating process there just to put in the latest um, data that we have. I think it includes the latest census data as well. Um, so it will be made public when we come forward to you with um, uh, an update on um, probably affordable housing will be the next um, thing that we bring to you to make some decisions around. Um, so that evidence base will see underneath that um, that options paper. Um, so at that point in time, it'll be made public. Okay, great. And do you have an estimate of when that might be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably at least. Yeah. Um, we aim to get it to you by the middle of this year, but um, it does depend when that work is finished. And um, yeah, we do have a bit of a resource challenge at the moment with a, a vacancy in the, in the manager role in that team, but um, we're working towards around mid-year. Councillor Wani, I think you might have some more questions. I do have some more questions. <laughs> You can, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> so, uh, as it is in our housing strategy, is there anything that we can do um, about those um, instances where that's happening? Um, through you, Chair. Um, Land and Housing Corporation's current model is to look for partnerships with developers um, to upgrade or update their housing stock. And um, so, Eden Street's an example of that in, in Arncliffe, where um, there's substantially more dwellings on the site than there are now. 
um, and a proportion of those are returned to social housing and the rest of them are sold off in the private market to fund the development. Um, so that, that's the model that they're pursuing. Um, that one was state significant development, so it was assessed by the Department of Planning and um, Council didn't have a, a big role in that. We made a submission, but that was about it. Um, so they, they do have um, a fair bit of um, autonomy under state policy to develop their own sites. In some cases, they don't need to come to Council at all. Um, in other cases, they need to lodge DAs, but they, they have the benefits of being the Crown, so we can't refuse their applications. Um, The best way to protect them is really not to um, to, up, to give them an uplift in terms of yield through planning controls. So if we leave things the way they are, um, then those, those buildings are likely to remain unchanged. Um, if we were to give them higher height limits and, and greater floor space, for example, that would encourage them to be redeveloped and they'd be lost. So um, we wouldn't be successful in um, undoing anything that we've done in terms of uplift in areas like that now. Um, but they are essentially in a holding pattern for now, um, unless Council does something to change the planning controls on those sites. So um, we will look at a more deliberate strategy around that. But in the meantime, I think we're, we're pretty safe in assuming that they'll stay because that's not economically viable for them to be demolished in the current under the current planning controls. So. <clears throat> Thank you. Are there any further questions? Yeah, through you, Chair, that, that's exactly right. We would need to look at a different building form um, for those ones, so they do have a setback from the street, you know, possibly even a small front yard like a terrace house would have to give that separation. Um, Council has agreed to look at Botany Road, south of Gardeners, um, and we're looking at the possibility of having, um, not having a requirement there for retail because the, the shopping strip would end up quite long and probably not viable. So, but we would look at a different setback arrangement there to make sure that people had privacy and, and so on. Thank you. Um, any further questions or comments, councillors? So I'd just like to um, thank staff for the comprehensive suite of documents we had tonight. They took a lot of um, effort to put together. So we had the committee recommendation before us to endorse um, this item. So all those in favour? All those against? I declare the item carried. And... There being no further items, I declare the meeting closed at 7.36pm.
Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the City Works and Assets Committee tonight. Um, so we have um, two councillors that wish to attend the meeting via audio link. That is Councillor Fardell and Councillor McDougall. Can I have a mover? Moved, Councillor Sooner, seconded Councillor Jansen. All those in favour say aye, against, declare it carried. Are there um, any disclosures of interest that any councillor would like to make in relation to the item? <coughs> no disclosures of interest. And um, Okay, that takes us to the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 8th of February 2023. Are there any questions or changes in relation to those minutes? Or everyone can have a mover? Move, Councillor Sooner, seconded Councillor Jansen. All those in favour say aye, against, declare it carried. There's no... Um, items by exception. There's no public forum, so it takes us to the report, which is 005. <coughs> it's a proposed closure and sale, part of road reserve at the rear of 232 and 234 King Street mascot. Can we please have a overview, please? Okay. Yep, through you, uh, Madam Chair. So this, this proposal was, was actually presented to the strategic land and property meeting in November. And it's very similar to a proposal we considered last month for uh, the rear of 254 King Street. So the owner of numbers 232 and 234 King Street um, has approached council about acquiring part of the road reserve uh, between the rear of their, uh, their rear property boundary and the curb and guttering in Hatfield Street. So each of those sites is uh, around 33.5 square metres each. And I think the image on page three of the report sort of shows um, the, the, the two stretches of, um, of road reserve that they're interested in acquiring. <clears throat> on further investigation, the, the proposal to acquire uh, 232 um, had some impact. So it's had, it would have some impact on both the, the turning circle in the cul-de-sac and also the impact of the access to the, um, to the library. So we've recommended that that not be supported and we just uh, look at the, the uh, sale of that section of road reserve at the rear of 234. So in proposing uh, that, or recommending that council proceed, um, and as mentioned during the last um, consideration, it would produce a good planning outcome in that it would overcome the sawtooth effect of various um, um, variable rear boundary alignments. Um, and we've obviously set that precedent before with a number of properties uh, in Hatfield Street uh, acquiring um, that, that road reserve and adding to their, their existing allotments. So if the proposal is supported, um, it is subject to the road closure process and also um, the classification to operational. So that road closure process will take um, at least 12 months because uh, it in, does involve community consultation and uh, various uh, plans put together. It's recommended at a sale price of $80,000. So it was uh, determined at that level by um, our independent valuers um, based on highest and best use and adding to their existing land holding. And also, if it's supported, uh, we would recommend that we enter into a deed of agreement before we start this process, because it's quite a time-consuming process, to commit uh, the, the um, applicant to cover all costs. And, and there's a number of costs associated with the road closure, subdivision, etc., uh, as well as the, the legal transfer costs, as, as well as the, the actual um, purchase price. So it is, it is recommended for your approval. Thank you for that summary. Do I have a mover? Moved Councillor Jansen, seconded Councillor McDougall. 
all those in us. Any speakers? Um, I, I look, I don't, don't know the history, but it's 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 basically, I guess, the nature strip. The road reserve itself is so the the road is this wide, but the formation of the road is only so wide. So it's really the nature strips. Uh, but these properties uh, have all frontage to King Street, rather than having frontage to to uh, Hatfield Street. So hence uh, that I guess the the various approaches about buying that little bit of bit of strip, which um, and it's not contiguous now. Um, there's there's no footpaths or anything like that. Everyone has to go to the other side of Hatchfield Street or walk on the road to 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 get to to Masco. I guess anecdotally, um, most of those sections of um, road reserve have already been closed. So pretty much anyone that parks along the left-hand side um, would have to cross the road if they wanted to, to walk um, yeah, um, safely towards the library, for example, and, and the shops. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. So that wall there is an adjoining property which has already acquired their road reserve and they've built right to that reserve and put the fence right on it. Yeah, yeah. So if I can maybe assist, so what, what you see, the pattern on the map on page 13, um, where all the existing properties already go there, so the majority of them have rear lane parking access because they don't have parking from King Street. So um, what this does then is it, it um, would allow this property then to create parking, but it's a cul-de-sac, so it, it ends... Um, you could sort of see where um, the square finishes, where the trees are, and that's our car park there and our mascot library and museum. So people don't, um, where you can see it's sort of a bark garden, if you like. So people wouldn't walk along there to step in there. It looks a bit deceiving there. It's not actually that long. That the, Just the angle of the shot makes it look like it's a long area. It's not that long and the footpath is on the other side. So um, most people walk around that, down that end anyway and with prams and everything. Yeah, and the majority of that, um, those road reserves have already been sold. So it's not a continuous space to walk as it is. And the mascot um, car park itself has the um, accessible parking for the library. <coughs> I guess my other question around it was that it's obviously going to take a lot of staff time to do this process. And um, it says um, that the owner has agreed to be responsible for the costs in the matter, um, but clearly not for the staff time. Um, That's the question. Yeah, so I guess that my, my question is, you know, for, for $80,000, is, is, is the process to go through these small sales of land, is that really a great use of our staff time? Yeah, yeah look, just on, on that, the, it, sorry, it just reduces the op op operational costs. Yeah, it certainly yeah, will reduce our operational costs in terms of maintaining uh, that area, but also um, the, the road closure process itself, there's community consultation. So it's the steps from here are not that not that time consuming. Certainly we, we have to notify all adjoining residents around that little area and consider any submissions received as part of that. But it's, um, and a lot of the other um, processes would be, for example, 
lawyers involved in the transfer and, and any subdivision app applications. Um, through the Chair, if I could also add, uh, if this is a, a process that is undertaken, the land will become rateable land for the future. So there is some financial gain for Council, small, but as you're, uh, you know, if you're talking about offsetting the staff time now, going forward and into the future, it becomes rateable land. Sorry, through the chair. There isn't a reservation on his land, on private land now. It's not like when we reserve it for future purposes. It is just classified as road uh, and he has his private boundaries. There is no impact on the, on the private residential land. It simply will remain status quo. Any other questions? All right, we have a recommendation in front of us. We've got a mover and a seconder. All those in favour say aye. aye. Again.